Welcome everyone to today's event on getting hired at the community college. This is part of our three part event series, exploring careers in teaching at a community college. It's great to see so many people with us. My name is Kate Diamond. I'm going to introduce things and then immediately hand things over to Katie Dixie, our host for this series and our speakers. We've got a packed hour and a half with lots of questions and time for audience Q&A as well. So I hope folks are ready to listen and engage in our discussion today. Um, this event is being hosted by the CERTLE Network. And um, since many people come to our events for the first time, I wanna talk briefly about what CERTLE is before starting things. We are the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning. We're a network of 38 universities in the US and Canada working to make the sciences more diverse by changing how they're taught. That is a very broad charge. So what that actually means is we um, work to teach STEM grad students and postdocs about inclusive evidence-based teaching and learning skills so that they can become both excellent researchers and teachers. And we know that so many students at least have some part, if not all of their higher education experience in community colleges. And so understanding more about what those institutions are like, who the students are that those institutions serve, and how we can be phenomenal instructors at those institutions and in those learning environments is really central to our, to our mission. So um, we're very happy to be running this series for I think the third or fourth time. Um, and very grateful to all the work that Katie does with her um, colleagues spread out across many community colleges um, around the US. Um, if folks wanna learn more about us, I definitely invite you to go to our website, but at this point, I will cut myself off and hand things over to our host for the day, Katie Dixie. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I, I really appreciate your introduction always, and it's always such a pleasure to be here. Um, and a pleasure to have all of you here joining us today. I just want to get a sense for who's here and, and what you're looking to get out. And, and I'm curious if any of you attended our first uh, session in this series. As Kate mentioned, it's a three-part series. Uh, so I believe there's a poll. All right. So did you attend the first event in this series, which was introduction to community college or teaching at community college? All right. Wow. Well, I Went to a community college, but I didn't attend this event, the first event. Great, great. Well, uh, welcome, welcome to our to your first time with us today, um, and I'm glad to hear that you're you're coming with a background from the community college, uh, which is really great. So it looks like we actually have a lot of new faces this time. So welcome everybody, and welcome back for those of you who are here with us before. I have another question for you, which is, are you planning to apply to a job at a community college? Or are you currently applying? So we're going to launch another poll. And so if you could answer on the poll, I will launch that right now. Are you planning to apply? Or are you applying maybe right now? Okay. So I'm seeing a good split of folks who say yes, um, but also some who aren't sure. And so maybe today might be a way to convince you that this might be a career option for you, or at least give you some more information if it is something that you think you want to explore. Because uh, again, I, I really think this is a, a wonderful option for folks who are interested in some sort of teaching career. And you're going to hear from some amazing panelists who will tell you a lot more about their experiences. Um, so as Kate mentioned, my name is Katie Dixie. I am the California, the uh, California Regional Collaborative Program Coordinator. I'm also our Assistant Director for a Center for uh, STEM Education at UCLA or um, in Los Angeles. So I have with me today uh, one of my interns from our program, Kelly. Kelly, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, yeah. Katie. Yeah, I'm Kelly Yoon Strathmore, uh, this year's Aspire to Lead intern, and I'm a graduate of University of California, Los Angeles, um, in the MFA, uh, in the humanities, and specifically film and television. Um, I also have a STEM background uh, prior to the MFA professionally, so that's led me here to help support these programs. And today I'll be keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to put your questions to the panelists, and we'll try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion of each section. 
Thank you so much, Kelly. I'm so glad you could be here and to help us with that. Um, and then, of course, we have Kate, who introduced herself earlier. So thank you. Before we introduce our panelists, I just want to give you a little bit of context, especially since some of you are joining us for the first time. Um, again, this is a three-part series, and it's going to be three different panels with different faculty members on each, talking about um, you know, the first one was about introduction to community college, what it's like to teach there. And I saw in the chat a question about where you can find it. The recording should be available, if not now, soon. Um, so we can share that link with you. But the next one will be about diversity, equity, and inclusive teaching. And it's a really, really important topic and, and really particularly valuable and, and important to talk about within the community college setting. So that's on December 1st, and I hope you'll come join us then as well. Uh, and so Again, this is a little bit more inf information about our series. Just to give you a little bit more context as well as about the program that puts this on, in addition to CERTL, I represent a program called Aspire, which is actually a national alliance for um, really creating more inclusive and diverse STEM faculty. And so we have, it, it connects with lots of people across the country. There's a couple different arms. Um, but really the goal is to help prepare STEM faculty to be really inclusive and effective teachers, and particularly when it comes to um, really helping with the retention of students from underrepresented groups who tend to leave STEM um, classes or degrees at a higher rate than others. And so another part of that is diversifying faculty through recruitment and hiring. And so that comes a lot of the time here from what we're trying to do is to get more folks interested in uh, careers, especially working with future faculty. And so bringing in more diverse future faculty, giving them some better training into how this, um, how to get involved. So I'm from the Regional Collaborative. There are three different regional, well, actually now I think there's five different regional collaboratives. There's two in California, one in Iowa, one in two in Texas, and one in Florida, so six actually. Uh, together, we work with uh, four-year and two-year institutions, so community colleges, universities, local colleges, to try and prepare graduate students and postdocs interested in teaching at a two-year college, at a community college. So a lot of this is through putting on internship programs, uh, creating internship programs, workshops, and trainings, and things like that. So this is what is part of this uh, initiative to try to increase uh, folks interested in this career where really diversity and, um, you know, really plays a big role in the community college level. So that's enough about me. Why don't we hear from our panelists today? Um, why don't we have them go around and just introduce yourself and maybe give us a little bit of a background on how you got involved in community college, how you got started there. So we'll start with Sasha Moore. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're watching this. It's the morning for us in Southern California. Um, I'm Sasha Moore, she, her, hers. I am a professor of English at Golden West College in Huntington Beach, which is in Orange County here in Southern California. And I'm also the district coordinator of equity, inclusion, and compliance for the three colleges in my district. And so um, I've been doing that one for about a quarter of my, my teaching career. So that's a newer position for me, but I love it. And that's how I got involved in CERTL and Aspire and the whole group. Um, I got into community college teaching because I was a community college student, a first generation one, and I had no idea what I was doing. And so I sort of ended up at a community college. I was really young. I didn't even know I was going to graduate high school when I did. And so I was extremely underprepared, went to a community college, and a couple of the professors I had there completely changed my life and trajectory. And I realized instantly that I wanted to pay that forward. So I completed grad school, came back to teach at a community college just to see what that was like, and then never left <laughs> because I loved it so much. And now I spend all my time trying to indoctrinate everyone else so that you can all join me in this wonderful, you know, utopian vision of, of community college. So there I've been straight up with you. You know that my perspective is very skewed, but also I truly do love this work and I hope that we can give you some great information to help you get involved if you would like to do that. Hey, thank you. I'm excited to hear from all of your wisdom in this um, and glad to hear that you've kind of come from a lot of different perspectives here. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, why don't we hear from Rich Roberts now? Hi, I'm Rich Roberts. I uh, teach chemistry at Des Moines Area Community College, and I've been at Des Moines Area Community College for about 15 years now. Um, 
before that, I, I bounced around uh, for a number of years in a limited term and adjunct teaching uh, positions. So I have experience at four-year private institutions, four-year public institutions, research universities. So I, I have a lot of perspective in terms of all of these different uh, teaching platforms. Uh, before coming to DMAC, I'd spent about five years teaching at a community college in the Twin Cities uh, in an adjunct teaching position, and then eventually got this full-time position at Des Moines Area Community College. Um, I've gradually worked my way into more administrative types of situations. I'm the science district chair, so I oversee a lot of the initiatives uh, across all of our campuses. We've got five or six campuses and a dozen centers. We also have high school programs, so I oversee a lot of what goes on in terms of science at all of those locations. And then locally, I'm the, the group leader, so I'm in charge of staffing and maintaining order, I guess, uh, within the science department. Um, I really enjoyed, of all the teaching uh, positions that I've had, I've enjoyed the community college teaching the most. Uh, it tends to be the most collaborative that I've, I've been in. Uh, some of the uh, environments that I've been in, uh, particularly at research universities, can be very competitive. Uh, both uh, within the department and between departments. You had departments that just hated each other, just <laughs> a very, very strange uh, environment. And I, I, you know, have never run into that here at the community college. I can walk down the hall and ask to borrow uh, a piece of equipment from uh, a biology faculty without qu any questions being asked. Uh, they'll uh, pretty much allow me to use it. And uh, it wasn't always that uh, collaborative at some of the other there probably are very fine institutions, that, but I, I had some uh, experience at some of these others that uh, were maybe uh, a little less so. Um, but um, I've really enjoyed uh, teaching at the community college. I also really enjoy the diversity of students that we have. Um, that they have all different backgrounds, all different interests, all different needs. Uh, and it's, it's fun to kind of see these people learn and grow and uh, head off in their own directions. Uh, whatever that may be. Thank you. It sounds like you have a lot of interesting perspectives for us too from a lot of different uh, backgrounds and, and places that you've been and I'm glad to hear that about your students. I hear that from community college faculty all the time so that's really great to hear. It's consistent across the board. Uh, great, thank you so much and uh, how about Curtis? I believe your microphone might be muted. You would think I would have figured out how to use Zoom by this point in, in our exciting. Uh, so I'm Curtis Mitchell. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I blundered into community college teaching and discovered that I loved it. Um, I was in a PhD program and what I learned about myself in that program is that I don't like math research very much but I really love teaching. Uh, so I spent some time looking for an environment where teaching would be the priority. Uh, tried to get high school teaching jobs, which was difficult because I didn't have any formal teacher training. Uh, wound up discovering community colleges um, and got hired and taught for five years at Greenfield Community College, which is a small rural college in Western Massachusetts. Um, then moved to Iowa for my partner's job. Um, and by great good fortune, Kirkwood was hiring for a director of developmental math position. Um, this is sort of a hybrid administrative faculty position. Um, like it seems like a lot of my co-hosts are in uh, where I teach about a half time and then spend the other half. I do adjunct faculty hiring and mentoring. Um, I'm on the search committees for new full-time people. Um, and then I do whatever needs to be done around the department. So hopefully I've picked up some stuff that can be of help to you. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, definitely, I think we have some great things to learn from you as well. Uh -huh. great. So we put this into three different sections, kind of just organize some questions by uh, topic. So thinking about navigating the job market, preparing some application materials and interview process. And so after each section, we're gonna have a couple of different questions and then we're gonna take some questions from you in the audience. 
we'll try our best to get to as many questions as possible. Some of them we might wait and hold off on in case we do talk about that maybe in the next one. Um, and then hopefully at the very end, we'll have even more time for your particular questions as well. So again, pop those in the chat as folks are talking and we'll, we'll make sure to get to them during those periods. Let's start off with um, navigating the job market. I have a question for Rich and Curtis. And Rich, you said you started as an adjunct. And so I'm, I'm wondering what advice you have about starting as an adjunct versus trying to get a full-time position. And if there's a difference in that application process between adjunct and full-time teaching. I think you're muted again, sorry. Uh. There you well, go. The, the big difference in terms of the application process is that the um, adjunct uh, positions tend to be less layered in terms of the uh, application process. Uh, you basically apply to the pool. Um, someone like me probably reviews the pool and looks for people that match the needs uh, that I currently have. And my, my needs change all the time. Sometimes I need a and P instructors, sometimes I, I need, you know, chemistry instructors more. So it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Uh, so I kind of pick through those to, to find those people. Um, and then generally the, the interview process is oftentimes just me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, a phone interview, and then usually a follow-up with a face-to-face -face interview. Uh, occasionally, um, as a chemist, I don't always feel that I have the expertise to address some of these other areas. So sometimes I'll bring in uh, one of my colleagues to to meet with this people as well, these people as well. Um, the um, full time interviews tend to be a lot more uh, uh, steps in the process. Uh, usually, there's a HR review uh, of all the applicants. Uh, they they provide us with the the screened applicants after that point. Um, and then uh, we usually have a committee that reviews all the applications. We score them using the rubric um, and, uh, and then recommend people to uh, formally interview. And, and that can oftentimes, again, have multiple steps in terms of a phone interview versus an in-person interview, or nowadays we're having Zoom interviews for these sorts of things. Um, now, in terms of like full time uh, interviews, I, I certainly recommend that people pay close attention to the job description. Uh, there oftentimes are key phrases that are mentioned in there, uh, things like teamwork or diversity or, or things like that. So you certainly want to address whatever experience you have that, that matches uh, the position closely. Um, Adjunct teaching, we, we do not uh, have a, a, a great deal of, of that sort of uh, uh, description in there, but usually our HR department has a couple of questions about uh, people's perspectives about uh, the function of a community college. So um, sometimes I, I, I kind of pay attention to this person that they've never taught before. Do they have any idea what a, a community college is all about? Uh, what type of students will they be teaching? Um, you know, just just some perspective that, that they kind of match uh, that they're uh, they, they, they're a good match in terms of their uh, uh, background and their ideas about uh, teaching and, and what they'll be in for uh, in terms of teaching. Uh, I, I, you shouldn't say in for, <laughs> but it can be a challenge because uh, I, I know that I've taught at private four-year colleges where you know everybody has you know top level uh, SAT and a ACT scores. Um, so that's a whole different uh, uh, type of teaching than when you're teaching to people that, you know, we're basically an open enrollment institution. We've got people that just barely scraped by. We've got people, and but then I, again, I, I see people that probably could compete at the top colleges in the, the country. And then we have people that are returning uh, for training for various other purposes, uh, particularly in the sciences. We see a lot of people that are heading into the healthcare professions. I don't know, anything else that <laughs> I should address in all of this? Well, thank you. It's, it sounds like there there certainly is a, a difference between that and Curtis. I wonder if you want to weigh in and then maybe if you have anything else you can think of or we can always come back to some things as well. Yeah, I wanted so and I'm not muted this time. Good. Um, 
a lot of institutions do, as Rich says, basically keep an open applicant pool for adjunct positions. So we wouldn't necessarily post a job listing saying we need math instructors. We would go and say, who's put in an application to teach math? Um, so if you're interested in teaching at a community college and you're at all near one, I would encourage you to get into one of those applicant pools um, so you might have the chance to be an adjunct. In general, you're unlikely to be hired for a full-time teaching job at a community college without, at the very least, some sort of teaching experience. Um, not necessarily, mine was as a TA and then adjuncting at a, some satellite state universities, so I hadn't taught at a community college, but definitely getting that experience is key, I think, to be competitive as a full-time applicant. I think institutions vary a lot in how much they tend to hire their adjuncts into full-time positions. Um, it's something I like to do when we can because they're people who, in a lot of cases, I've worked with and seen teach. Um, so I have a more robust sense of their qualifications. So I think of the last four full-time hires we've made it at a as a department, half were of existing adjunct faculty. Um, there are other institutions I know that are much less prone to hire adjuncts. And part of that may be, depending on how it's set up, the people involved in the full-time hiring process may not have much familiarity with you in your teaching. So I think working as an adjunct is definitely helpful to getting a full-time job but that may not be at the institution where you're adjuncting so if you have your heart set on that it's certainly not a, a guaranteed route um, making sure that you establish some um, connections when you're adjuncting if at all possible have someone come and observe your teaching so if you're either applying there or using someone as a reference to apply elsewhere the more specific things they can say about you as a teacher and as a person working there um, the better uh, someone had asked in chat what an adjunct is so an adjunct is just a part-time instructor usually hired on a semester by a semester basis instead of a longer term contract. Another thing to know is that the adjunct hiring period can run all over the place. If we know we'll need someone in fall, we'll hire in spring. But I've certainly been in the position of calling people in August saying, is there any chance you could come in in the next few days for an interview for a class that starts next week? I don't like doing that, but sometimes circumstances make it happen. So just be aware that if you're um, putting in an application to one of these adjunct pools, when you get contacted, it might vary a lot. Great, thank you. And thank you for clarifying that as well. I'm thinking our, our expert blind spot here didn't even let me define what I meant by adjunct. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, great. So I, I have kind of another question then, Sasha, because it does sound like there's different types of jobs out there and, and really, you know, they really vary, especially when it comes to job openings. Do you have any suggestions or resources for how you, folks might find these job openings or how you might tell if a good position is, is a good fit for you? So maybe like adjunct versus full time. Of course I do. Of course I do. Uh, so <laughs> I first I want to acknowledge I've been kind of trying to answer some questions as they're coming up in the chat, but I am notorious in these webinars for being a panelist and then getting so obsessed with, with what's in the chat that I lose focus on the questions. So if you ask me something directly, please know that I will try to answer it at some point during this conversation and you'll have access to our contacts. So if I don't answer your question, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just trying to be a better panelist than I normally am. Um, so so I wanted to mention that first. Now, as far as job openings are concerned, because I have always worked in the California Community College system, which is gigantic, that is the one with which I am most familiar. And I can tell you that by far the best resource for finding job openings here in this state is the CCC registry. And so the link for that is simply cccregistry.org. I really strongly recommend that if you are in California or you're considering the possibility of working in California at any point, you take a look at that site and register. You can select whether you're looking at part-time or full-time, 
thank you. I was going to post that later, but thanks, Katie. Um, or you can also um, just go by discipline. Also, if you start to do what the three of us have done, the three of us being the panelists today, which is transition from a faculty centered career into a semi faculty, semi administrative role or something like that, you can actually access full time or part time faculty, administrative, classified, etc. So regardless of your interests, if you're interested in the system, CCC registry is a really, really excellent resource for teaching in California. The other thing I want to mention is sometimes folks think that, you know, obviously I want to go directly into a full time career. Well, everyone wants to go directly into a full time career because that's where the money and the benefits are, but it's not necessarily the best thing for you as a professional um, in a lot of different ways. And so you should expect that you're going to have some time that you spend as a part time instructor. And this is actually a good thing for you, really good professionally. It also allows you to figure out what's going on with the school. <laughs> you don't want to commit to a long tenured career at a place that you, it turns out, actually don't like. Um, that is a really, really bad commitment to make. So it's important for you to also be interviewing the schools as you're going through. So when you're looking at these job announcements, it's really important to um, make sure that you're looking for, as was mentioned earlier, these keywords that are important to you. Um, for example, I'm extremely devoted to equity and inclusion. If I come across a job announcement where I can tell those are buzzwords and they're not being used properly, that's a big sign for me that that job is not a good not a good fit for me. These folks are not in the same place I am. They don't have the same values I do, and that's okay, but I'm not in a position in my career where I want to come and do the teaching of that information. I like to walk into a place that shares my values so that we can continue to grow together. So things like that are really important. If you are you know, focused on anatomy, don't go for the gen bio position. Go for something that seems like a really good match for your skills and experience because you are going to be spending a lot of your time doing that work. Um, so the other thing I want to mention on this note is it's not a bad thing for you to, within reason, touch base with department chairs and deans. If you have recently gotten your master's degree or you are you have gotten that conferred or you're about to, you are then eligible to teach in most cases at the community college level. There is nothing wrong with sending a very short and polite email to a department chair and a dean and saying, you know, hey, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. I've attached my most updated CV. I recently received my master's degree in fill in the blank here. Here's my contact information. I would love to teach for you at some point. Um, one thing that we have to do often is emergency hiring. And so it is a, a very common practice that folks will have in their inbox a file that says 911 or something like that. And that's where we keep shuffling in all of the CVs that we receive so that if we do have to hire someone don't let this scare you, but this is a real thing. On Friday for a class that begins on Monday, <laughs> we know exactly where to look. So don't worry, you'll usually have more um, leeway than that and, and lead time. But that is a situation that occurs. So don't hesitate to reach out, not in an aggressive and oppressive way. You don't need to make contact every few weeks, but you know, once a year, something like that, if you want to. Um, get your name out there. You'll have department chairs and deans contacting each other. Sometimes they'll say, you know, is there someone you can recommend? You want Want to make a good impression so that you can be the person that they would recommend. Okay, so some of those are really informal methods, but frankly, they're some of the most effective ones in my experience. Thank you. And I, I saw Rich nodding his head quite a bit while you were talking there. Um, and I, I want to invite you if there's if there's resources like CCC registry or something like that within your state to feel free to add those to the chat as well or, or send them to me and we can send them out afterwards. Um, so thank you so much. And so my my next question here, and maybe you can also extrapolate on the, the last one as well, but what can graduate students or postdocs or our future faculty, whoever is here, do now to help them be competitive at a community college? And so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know, thinking especially now in the remote environment with COVID-19 and happening, what's the thing that they can really stand out and what might they consider before applying? So this question is for Rich or Sasha, whichever um, wants to weigh in to start. Okay, well, um, it like it's been said before, you know, experience, experience, experience uh, is certainly, you know, one of the more important things. And uh, I certainly consider people all the time that only have uh, TA experience uh, in graduate school. 
Um, Full-time positions, of course, generally are going to uh, give a lot of weight in terms of the, the scoring rubrics that we uh, use in terms of our uh, hiring uh, to number of years of experience. So uh, certainly getting your foot in the door, but uh, our, ad, our adjunct teaching, um, any uh, amount of teaching that they've had during their graduate years certainly counts. Uh, other things, I mean, I, I've hired people that uh, have worked in industry and they just are disillusioned and they want to make a transition. Uh, but sometimes uh, they have done other things that are the equivalent of teaching. They've done outreach. They, uh, you know, work with, uh, you know, clubs or organizations like the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or something like that. Uh, so they've got some uh, hands-on experience. So the more experience that you have um, working in uh, those type of uh, environments, um, in terms of the new world that we live in now, the more experience that you can get working with different platforms uh, that are used for teaching, uh, because you can never tell exactly what's going to be used. Uh, some places uh, are very prescriptive. DMAC, Des Moines Area Community College, is pretty prescriptive that we're supposed to use Blackboard Collaborate. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly having some familiarity with uh, other products like Zoom and Google Meets and all these other things, as well as the um, uh, other types of learning management systems, any experience that you can get. Um, certainly, if you're in a graduate uh, environment, uh, participating beyond what you have to do. I mean, you know, certainly as a, a, a graduate student, sometimes you're, you've got no choice. You're assigned to be a TA for a class, but certainly uh, uh, participating as much as you can in uh, things like curriculum development. Uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, instructors, uh, as I remember, not instructors, but professors, uh, had new ideas about teaching certain subjects and they, they wanted to uh, have you try that out in the classroom. So certainly being open and available to, to learning new things about uh, different teaching strategies. So, um, and in particular, one thing that I know that I also look for in terms of people that do have teaching experiences, what type of teaching experience do they have? Are they, you know, is it more of a lecture style format that they're uh, accustomed to? or have they uh, done some work with flipped classrooms? So I'm, I'm always impressed and read further if somebody mentions that they're uh, using flipped classroom or other student-centered uh, types of uh, teaching in the classroom, because I think that, that a lot of students nowadays uh, need to have a lot of variety in, in uh, the format. In particular, if you're stuck uh, teaching uh, through Zoom, you know, what can you do to kind of uh, get more students engaged? So uh, any experience that you have kind of engaging others uh, through whatever media that you can. Uh, hopefully at some point we get back to face-to-face -face instruction. I, I kind of miss uh, reading my students, but uh, everyone has their, their camera off or most of them have their camera off. And uh, so I, I can't tell if my bad uh, dad jokes uh, actually land or not uh, quite often. Thank you. And Sasha, I know you run an internship program and work with our interns as well. And so I wonder if you have advice on this. Yeah, I sure do. If you have access to a community college faculty internship program of some kind, I really strongly encourage you to take um, advantage of that. So you can look at local HR, um, you know, HR departments for the local community colleges. You can kind of check in. We usually try to contact department chairs at um, local universities, folks who might actually come and later teach for us. So you will have a high priority if you are local um, in many cases, not, not universally, but in many cases. Um, so really, you can get access to my my former intern who now runs the program with me always says it's the ultimate backstage pass so and i fully agree with that i'm constantly quoting her um and and you know i'm an english professor so i do a lot of weird quoting but that's my favorite one of all time at least so far um i think it's really really important to get a sense of what the whole job is you know a lot of people have misconceptions a lot of people talk about community college students in a really disparaging way and the community colleges in general is very deficit minded particularly if you know Never have had access to a community college as a student or as an instructor or you're kind of thinking of it as a stepping stone something like that 
you need to know uh, that our students have full and open access, but our faculty, we could not be more exclusive and exclusionary about who we let in to teach our students because we are fully and wildly devoted to their success and their safety and their happiness. And so you really want to make sure that you know what the mission of the community college is. And there are a few things that you can do to kind of wrap your mind around what that looks like. One is do some basic research about the community colleges that you're applying to. Understand what their demographic data looks like. What is their mission statement? What are the new programs that they're running? What kind of relationship is there between instruction and student services? These are concepts that you should have in mind as you are approaching this work. It's not just about your scholarship and your research. It's very much about what you can bring to the community and how you can build that community. And so if you can demonstrate an authentic and genuine devotion to that work, that is going to really help you moving forward in the community college environment, not just working with students, but as a professional and working with your colleagues and other administrators. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about this is really get to know equity and inclusion and anti-racism and how these fundamental aspects work in the classroom space. This is really important. There are some really wonderful resources that you can check out both online. And I know all of you are going to now be like, what are the resources, <laughs> which I will share some of, but there are some really wonderful resources that you can find online, various websites and organizations, but you can also find some really fantastic books on this subject. So just doing some basic research, this is what we're all really good at, right? We're all really good students or we wouldn't be at this point. So do some of that work. Um, I strongly recommend checking out the book Grading for Equity. Um, there are things like that, resources like that, that you can take a look at and see, how could I be applying this to my students and to my scholarship? How can I be really bolstering student success and what does that look like for all kinds of different students whom I will encounter. I have taught a student who was 16 and one who was 80 in the same classroom in the same semester in the community college, as has been mentioned, but we will keep talking about because it's so fundamental to what we do. Our students are extremely diverse and it is the best part of this job. You need to be a really adaptable and dedicated instructor to best serve those students. And so I think having a really strong concept of what that looks like and how you are going to not only come in with your own approach, but also how you're going to continue to grow and be self-reflective as an instructor is vital to your success in this work and really important for, um, you know, being marketable in terms of getting hired in, into doing this work. Thank you. This is some really great advice that we're hearing here. And it, it sounds like there's definitely a lot you can do, even if you're not even actively teaching at the moment, um, but to really get out there and, and make some space for yourself. Thank you. So I think now is a great time to stop and, and answer some of these great questions coming in through the chat. And so I'm going to have Kelly. She picked out a few, I believe, that um, she'd like to, to ask our panelists. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, um, this one sort of follows the, the last question um, and it, it about what students can do now to sort of prepare. And so one of the questions, actually two questions were similar is, how does one get started with teaching experience right after completing the graduate program? Because that seems to be a competitive characteristic. And on a similar note, um, you know, what suggestions do you have for getting more teaching experience if your department doesn't really allow grad students to be instructors of record? So open to any of the panelists. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, internship programs, we are very into these in California. <laughs> I created and run one. We are just finishing up our, um, our interviews for that program in the next couple of weeks here. We do this annually. It's been a really great process. We have a two-part program. So we actually hire interns. And then at the end of that internship, anybody who gets hired into a part-time position at any college, doesn't have to be one of ours, although that's obviously an added benefit, gets invited to our first semester faculty cohort. But what I learned five years ago is that no one ever leaves it. And so it's no longer the first semester faculty cohort. It's just the 2.0 version of the program. Um, if you can find something like that, you can get experience where you have a really devoted mentor, where you have opportunities to teach in the classroom. And again, you have, as I was mentioning, that you know universal all access backstage pass. So you can see what the whole job looks like. That's really important. Teaching is a vital part of what we do, but it is not the only part of what we do. And so having an understanding of what that looks like, making those internal connections, all of that is very important to your success in these work. In this work, um, Nicole's asking in the chat right now: Are these internships paid? Some of them, 
Some are, some are not, and they all are paid at different rates and with different language around them. <laughs> so I can tell you this, the investment that you would make in doing the internship will definitely pay off because it will give you connections to getting jobs and it will help you stand out. And that's really what you're looking for. We have pools of hundreds of candidates all of them are awesome. How are you going to be the one who stands out to us? You're going to have some sort of experience that's unique and shows us your devotion to this, to teaching at this level. An internship is a really great way to do that. I certainly, you know, even once you get in, we don't have a formal process like that in, uh, at least not in uh, our a community college at Des Moines Area Community College. Um, it tends to be more informal. Uh, Iowa State University is only about uh, half hour away. So we do get a lot of students that uh, are seeking that type of experience and they'll contact me uh, looking for opportunities to sit in on a class or, you know, uh, and, and quite often that develops into something more where they, they uh, uh, maybe take over part of the, the lecture time. But it, it is a little bit difficult to get uh, them. Uh, I, I know that our, our departments have policies, you know, in terms of who can actually uh, be an instructor, but certainly uh, having the, the main instructor involved. But then once you're inside, uh, as an adjunct, get, you know, getting as much experience, we do have a pro professional de development program for our adjunct faculty uh, that uh, kind of expose them to all sorts of different teaching ideas and as well as the, the nuts and bolts of uh, being an adjunct instructor. Um, and then finding the mentors that uh, can help you along the way. Um, I do a lot of mentoring of people, particularly in the chemistry area, I'm more comfortable with that. Um, but I do help find people that are very experienced to mentor some of these newer faculty uh, to help them along so that uh, it isn't just like a couple of places where I uh, worked, I was just basically handed a book and told to go. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is much nicer if you have somebody that you can kind of share materials with as you uh, start uh, your teaching career, uh, people that uh, are willing to help you out or maybe share some of their uh, things that they've developed over the years. So. If you're in graduate school, um, one thing that can help is just to communicate to um, people in your department, uh, department chair or director of graduate studies, that you're interested in teaching and teaching opportunities because often schools will reach out to the university saying i'm trying to find someone to teach that um that was how i wound up while i was in graduate school teaching a um summer class pre-calc class at a private high school um, which wasn't community college teaching experience but it did help give me a more diverse teaching experience to draw on um, when i was applying if you're not in grad school, then you may not have that kind of connection, but even just keeping an eye on um, who's hiring around you, looking for work as a tutor. Tutoring isn't teaching, but it's experience, and the more you can get, the better. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I'm hearing there are a lot of questions that are in the chat that we're going to get to later. And so maybe we can come back to those um, in a couple of the sections. So I just want to move on a little bit. I also want to say some of the questions that are being asked, um, hopefully we'll get to answer briefly, but there's also a lot of those answers are in our first panel series um, about an introduction to teaching at community college as well. So you can always check that out too once it's posted, I believe uh, Kate said later today. Um, so I just we went to our next section, which is really thinking about application materials and, and how you apply uh, and, you know, what's the meat of the application. And so I have a question for um, either Sasha or Rich, I believe. Uh, so do you have any advice on how we could tailor our CV and cover letter for position at a community college? And particularly thinking about are there other documents that are required, like a teaching statement or diversity statement? What kind of things might they need to have? So I just did like a 90 minute training on this for some of the folks at UCLA last week and could totally do another five hours on it at least. So it's so funny to be answering this question very briefly, but I will give you this rundown. Number one, 
do not attach anything that isn't required. Um, if you work in or you're applying to a district in California, we are legally not allowed to consider application materials that we didn't ask for. So if you're like, I have 17 beautiful letters of recommendation, none were asked for, but these will get me the job. Um, no, they won't. Instead, we'll just keep scrolling through them to look for the things we asked for, because that's an unfair advantage if we do start to review materials that we didn't ask for from everyone. So don't waste your time um, looking for additional things that you can add just focus on making the things that are required really strong. For your CV, the first thing that we're going to be looking for is, are you qualified to teach what you are applying to teach? And so I would say you really want to highlight your degrees first. So your CV should start with education. And that's great that you went to the fanciest school of all time. We really don't care. Do you or do you not have a master's degree in this discipline that you're trying to teach? <laughs> do you have a PhD in it? Awesome. Tell us that. We're just looking for that information. Your CV, I always recommend this to my interns and anyone who asks. So I guess de facto, that's all of us here. Your CV should start with education. It should then go to teaching experience. It should then go to teaching related experience. And then everything else you want to put on there, do that after. But those are the three areas that we care about the most. And particularly if you're coming out of grad school and you're doing, like was mentioned a minute ago, some tutoring or some TA positions or something like that, where you're not the instructor of record, that's where the teaching related experience is going to come in handy. So that's what I'd recommend for the CV. The cover letter, if you are applying to a job, a specific job, you want to use the job announcement as if it is a prompt for an essay that you are writing. We are telling you exactly what we are looking for. So do not create a form letter. This is like creating a form personal statement or statement of purpose to apply to graduate school. Remember how you had certain chunks of that that you personalized to the departments that you were applying to? We want the same. We want to know that you actually want to work for our college and with our students. So what can you do to show us in there that you read our job announcement? We really want to see that you are addressing those specific areas that we mentioned in the job announcement in your cover letter. So that's really important. Other hot tips on the cover letter, do not under any circumstances go over one and a half pages for your cover letter. And I would say that's for a full-time position. If you are applying for part-time, really aim for a page. We do not want to see a full-scale novel from you. And I teach English, so I'm telling you, keep it succinct. That's what we want. We want to see if you are a candidate we would like to bring in for an interview. We will ask you the rest of those questions at that time. So be succinct, but get across your important information, things that make you stand out and things that really connect you to the specific position that we're asking about. We typically do not ask for letters of recommendation. That is a thing that you could get asked for. We almost always ask for unofficial transcripts. Be sure that you attach those and we will always have an online application that you have to fill out. Please make sure that you never, ever write something like C CV or C cover letter in the online application. Often we are told that we need to rate specific parts of the application, like the supplemental questions. And if your supplemental question number one answer is CCV, guess what that response is going to get? Zero. <laughs> we cannot give that a rated response and we can't go looking in your application for the answer you should have written there. So it's really, really vital that you do not waste your own time by not taking the whole application seriously or by adding in information that we didn't ask for. I know that sounds like a really hard line, but you know, you're know you going to spend a lot of time doing this. I don't want you to waste that time. Yeah. Richard Curtis, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I know that uh, in biology, particularly, um, sometimes the, the transcripts are hard, to, you know, hard to read because uh, biology is taught in a variety of different departments. Um, I, I know that particularly microbiology is one of uh, my uh, nemeses out there. Uh, because there are people that have experience with microbiology, but their coursework isn't necessarily labeled as microbiology. Uh, I know that in terms of our hiring matrix, uh, there, there's kind of the people that can teach general biology and any biology classes count uh, in order to teach that. But if you're teaching in a specialty area like uh, anatomy and physiology or microbiology, uh, you want to make sure that uh, your coursework kind of stands out uh, that we can uh, defend the idea that, that you're qualified to teach. Um, and there, and I can't even, you know, off the top of my head, think of some of these names, but I know that sometimes you, you have coursework that's in veterinary medicine or something, and somebody wants to teach microbiology. Uh, sometimes combing through that uh, can be difficult. So to be able to kind of point out which courses actually fit uh, the teaching uh, that you're proposing to do. Um, 
and, and making that clear. And sometimes it, it's not necessarily for me, I, I, I do a better job at this, but sometimes our HR uh, department does kind of a pre-screen on some of these. Uh, and usually the people that are, and I can say universally, the people in our HR department have no background in science. So sometimes they uh, miss some of these uh, uh, qualifications. So make sure that, that you're, if it isn't labeled uh, directly uh, uh, relative to the, the coursework or to the class that you're proposing to teach, make sure that you're, you're pointing out that this course is uh, essentially the, the same course that uh, uh, is required as part of my background. Thank you. Um, so I, I see just a couple of very quick questions here that I just want to point out one of, does it help to list classes taken in your CV or should you not worry about it? Um, or should you worry more about the length? It's not necessary. Um, the main reason we look at classes taken is if someone had, say, a math adjacent degree like math education and we're counting credits of math classes. Um, and in that case, we can go to the transcript to do it. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about putting that in the CV. Thank you. Um, I also just want to kind of re reiterate a few things that we pointed out in the chat when this is being recorded. So if you miss anything, you can always come back and watch it again. Um, but two, we'll, we'll be sharing on the CERTL event page the resources that we share in the chat. So all of these links that we're throwing in there, um, again, will, will be added. I apologize that I know most Lee California, but there are other resources out there that hopefully we'll be able to collect for you too. So um, with that, let's move on to our second question of this part. And so Curtis, maybe you can start us off, but what stands out in an application? And so what are some common mistakes that people make and what are things that they often leave out? Um, probably the most common is over-focusing on research. If people, especially if people are applying to both community colleges and four-year schools, they'll often have close to a page in their cover letter describing their dissertation research and their future research plans. And what that says to a community college is, I don't know what I'm applying for, or at least I am not ready for the reality I would face on your campus because some community colleges care a bit about research, some care not at all, but it's not the emphasis that it would be at a four-year school. So a brief mention of research is fine, but shouldn't be the focus. Um, in general, what stands out in an application, uh, particularly in a cover letter, is if you have some evocative examples of what you do in your teaching um, and what your classroom approach is. Um, keep in mind that we read a lot of cover letters. So something which makes you distinctive and different from the candidates, is there an activity you use in class you're particularly proud of? Is there an approach you do well? What would your students say about you that they might not um, say about other candidates? Um, anything that helps you stand out um, in a good way um, is really a plus. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is that if there's anything that might be viewed as a weakness in your CV, if your experience is more with teaching classes that don't quite line up with the job application, but you think you could do a good job of it, I would take those on in your cover letter because it's not as if, it, committees are still going to notice them if you don't mention them. But this is your chance to make a case for why, you know, I think you should consider me, despite the fact that you'll see this, because um, I really were looking for people who are reflective practitioners, who think about their teaching, about themselves as instructors, about how to improve. So the more in a cover letter you can convey that that's you, that you're aware of some of your strengths and weaknesses, I wouldn't go into detail on weaknesses that aren't visible in the CV, mind you, but um, I, the more I think we would tend to want to give you a shot. Thank you. Uh, Sasha or Rich, do you have anything you want to add? 
Yeah, these are all great points. I totally agree with everything that Curtis said. I would also add that um, we want to see that you actually want to be at this level. So in addition to not just having a sort of blanket statement that you're providing to everyone, or maybe you're not really showing your awareness of the work that you'll do at the community college, why do you want to be here? What about your experience, your identity, your passions makes you an ideal future community college instructor or a full-time community college instructor candidate or something like that? Um, I think it's really important to focus on how you are going to connect to and contribute to this environment. Also, what do you know already about the school that you're applying to? What do you know about their students? What makes you want to teach them specifically? really showing that you've done the work, you've done the research, and you see yourself as a potential contributor to that community. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to our third question and then see some amazing ones in the chat that I want to make sure we get to. Um, but to just get a sense, maybe Rich, you can help us out with this, of what the processes or the timeline for applications. Like how many do you get typically? Um, and and how many, how many applications you typically get for a single job, for example? Well, it, it, it kind of varies. Uh, I always say that it kind of varies inversely with the, the strength of the economy, <laughs> at least here in uh, central Iowa, that uh, if uh, the economy is doing well, then sometimes my applicant pool can be pretty sparse, uh, particularly in specialty areas or uh, physics, uh, uh, I know that the, the number of physics graduates are, are small. Uh, there was a period of time where I went two years before I even had a, an applicant uh, in a, a physics adjunct pool. So uh, that can be relatively small. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I would say a typical, you know, we, we've probably got dozens of, of applicants at any one uh, time uh, in the adjunct applicant pools. Full-time applications can, be, can also vary. Uh, it, it depends on how specialized. We recently uh, started a, uh, a review for a uh, microbiology position, and that's a very specialized area. So we only had about 20 applicants that were, were viable uh, going into that. Uh, but when we adver advertise for a general biology position, we could have 50 to 100 uh, that make it through the HR uh, pre-screen uh, before they actually land at our committee. So. Um, the, the numbers vary. So, and, and I always tell people uh, in terms of adjunct teaching to be persistent in terms of applying. Uh, just because I didn't need your particular skill this semester doesn't mean that I won't need that skill next semester. Uh, or in an emergency situation, you know, as was mentioned, that uh, if you have the, the luck of contacting me a couple of weeks ahead of uh, the semester, you're the person that I'm going to remember uh, either speaking with or exchanging emails with about teaching and uh, I can tell you that it's very frequently that uh, that person uh, showing that interest that late uh, heading into the semester uh, is going to be at the top of my list of people that I contact to uh, uh, teach. Um, and this comes up all the time for me. I, I always hate getting a, a phone message or an email from my adjunct instructors uh, a week before classes because inevitably it uh, is the sorry to tell you, but I, I just was offered a full time job. Uh, I uh, and I, I completely understand that I, I realize that uh, you can't persist in an adjunct teaching position forever. Uh, there are some people that do. I mean, that there are some people that enjoy doing that, and uh, perhaps they they have a significant other that uh, has uh, the major job in the family, and and uh, this is just something that they enjoy doing. Uh, in you know, as a part-time uh, occupation. Just to, to follow up um, quickly, just to clarify, so what's the timeline like if, if you apply to a full-time job? Like how long does that process take about? Um, I would say that the, the typical timeline is probably on the order of two to three months from the, the point of uh, the initial advertisement. Usually the advertisement is left out there for about a month. Um, we usually, immediately begin reviewing those right after uh, the applications right after it closes. Um, and then uh, between reviewing it and scheduling interviews that can take up to another month. And then once we have that, uh, it usually, as soon as we're done with our face-to-face -face interviews, we usually uh, sit down that day as soon as they finish and uh, kind of uh, 
make our selection and recommendation. So usually the, the process is pretty quick after that. Um, oftentimes it's not official until uh, we have board approval. So sometimes that, that depending upon where that interview lands in that schedule, uh, it can take up to another month uh, before uh, our board actually meets to, to approve these positions. So I would say two to three months is pretty typical for a full-time position. Thank you. And Sasha and Curtis, do you want to weigh in quickly on whether or not that's consistent with your experience as well, or, or are there are some differences where you're at? Um, you can just give me a thumbs up if it's about the same, but <laughs> about the same. All right, great. So, so that sounds pretty typical then, right? All right, let's hear some of your questions. Uh, Kelly's got a whole bunch of them picked out, so I'm going to let her uh, take over. Uh, thank you. Um... First one is, does the number and variety of classes you teach make a difference on the scoring rubrics during the application process? It depends. Um, we don't we don't have a space on the scoring rubrics for that, so it doesn't count into official score. I think in general, we'd like to see some evidence that a candidate has taught a variety of classes and had some success. Um, but it also really depends on the position listing. You know, if we're hiring someone entirely to teach developmental uh, pre-college level mathematics, we'd probably rather see someone with some deep experience in that than someone who did one of those classes and taught six different math classes, one each. So I, I think it, it really depends. Okay, if uh, no one else wants to jump in, I can skip to the next question, which is um, how much do community colleges care about applicants for the teaching positions, their actual grades in undergrad or grad school? I would say you probably want to have mostly A's and B's. Uh, you know, that, that, that pretty much anything below an A or a B, you know, certainly is going to, you know, call your uh, transcript into question. Um, we did hire somebody quite a few years ago. I remember being on the committee where they actually had an F on their uh, transcript. Uh, they repeated the course, of course. <laughs> and uh, got a higher grade, um, but certainly um, that uh, did stand out. It kind of stopped everyone in their tracks as we were kind of reviewing uh, that, that here's a person that has an F on, on their transcript. Uh, but Was that within the discipline, Rich? Because my well, sense- It was in the discipline. And yeah. I, I think that the person, if I remember right, in their uh, cover letter actually addressed that. And there, there was a, a extenuating circumstances uh, for that low grade. And the fact they went back and repeated it certainly helped out. Yeah, but, but I think if someone has, say, a C minus in a jet ed. No, no, it, you know, within the discipline. We don't care. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really uh, pay any attention to anything outside of the, the you know, science uh, at hand. I actually have a very different response to this question. Um, we have worked really hard to redact as much information as possible from transcripts. What we actually are looking to see is, do, do you have your degree? And oftentimes, some of the best stories from our applicants are, hey, I was exactly where some of these students are. I had a really, really wild first year. <laughs> I moved away from home. I went completely, you know, buck wild. I partied a bunch. Or, you know, I had this family tragedy and it totally affected my grades and I spent the whole rest of my undergrad trying to undo the damage I did to my GPA and so you'll notice I have a pretty low GPA I managed to get myself into grad school but it was through a lot of struggle sometimes those are more compelling stories for committees not that you should be aiming for that but I want you to know if you're sitting here going oh there are a lot of grades that aren't A's and B's and some of them are even in my discipline you shouldn't think that that discounts you from consideration. Um, I will tell you, we are in the process of completely removing transcript access to our positions, um, except from HR. 
And so only human resources can see that you have gotten the degrees that you need. We can't see your grades. And we instruct our faculty not to look at grades because who knows why you got that grade. Um, you can tell us if you have concerns about it. So totally different approach. Um, in, in most of the California colleges that I'm aware of, that is the direction that we're moving in because we know that's an area of extreme bias. And it's one that we don't have enough information to make determinations about. We want to hear that from you. And we're going to ask you to demonstrate your knowledge. We are going to want to make sure you have your degrees. We're also going to ask you to teach for us. And if you can't do that effectively, we'll know right away that you maybe failed the class or didn't do as well in a class that you should have done well in to be able to teach this discipline. So super different approach over here. Right. And I've, I've made that argument about grades. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of my roommates, his uh, research advisor, if you he gave you C's in, in terms of uh, your research credit. You know, literally that was considered good in that research group. A C minus meant that you were not doing very well. C plus meant that you were outstanding in this research group. So um, I, I certainly take that with a grain of salt. And I've made that, that argument before that uh, particularly in the graduate uh, world, uh, there are different philosophies in terms of grading uh, out there. I, you know, I've seen you know, people that are strict bell curve graders that uh, literally can tell you that I've, of the hundreds of students that I've had over, you know, the course of my career, I've only given three A's. <laughs> and so I, I know that there are uh, people out there that are like that uh, out in the universe. Uh, so I do realize that the, the grade probably means less. Uh, certainly having experience behind you, uh, if you do have that kind of a deficit, uh, certainly that, that you have been able to secure adjunct teaching positions and, and been successful at it certainly is going to override a lot of that if people are paying attention. That's awesome. Um, it, it sounds like a lot of the personalization of the application process happens in the cover letters. And so speaking on that, um, what do y'all have as far as what have you seen overused anecdotes and phrases in cover letters? That was a question that had come up. I work with a lot of students who are getting ready to transfer, right? Um, I, I only teach literature courses. The students I have are English majors. They're getting ready to transfer, uh, mostly to the UCs. And so they all have to write these personal statements. And if you've ever had this experience, you know that you always get at least one student who's had literally no struggle ever in their life. And they come in and they're like, what am I going to write on? This is supposed to be a compelling story. The worst struggle I ever had is a one time my alarm didn't go off and I was like seven minutes late to work. Do you even know how mad my mom and my boss were? And you're just going, oh my gosh, this is it. This is your big struggle in life. You're going to have a really hard time making a compelling case for your personal experience in the world, my friend who's 17. You know, And I think that that same thing happens in applications and particularly in cover letters. It's very easy to sniff out someone who is just really wanting a paycheck. We already know you want a paycheck. Everybody wants a paycheck. And by the way, that's an admirable goal, but do not try to make yourself something you're not like bring your whole self to work, bring your whole self to the cover letter and also make sure it's really you. Um, I think when you try to use buzzwords and they come across as synonyms, you know, like you went on the thesaurus function and you found all these words that sounded like community college friendly. Um, it can come across really quickly that you are not genuinely interested in this work or that you maybe don't know what you're getting yourself into. Also, um, personalize, make sure that your experience, you don't need to divulge a bunch of information that's deeply personal and potentially harmful to you. But if you have experience, um, like the example I was using just a few minutes ago, you know, you struggled a lot in the beginning of school and you, you know, had some interactions with student services or with an instructor that were particularly meaningful to you and they really changed your course and you want to pay that forward or whatever your particular story is, or maybe this is identity related for you. Um, my, one of my former interns always talks about the fact that as a Vietnamese woman, she never once saw a Vietnamese instructor, particularly a woman of color or in her entire academic career. And now she gets to undo that for her students who are Vietnamese. So if you have something like that, use that, but don't try to fabricate a story that's not yours to sound like you are somehow connected to the culture. So I would say be as authentic as you can in a way that feels safe and genuine for you. 
have somebody else read your materials too. Uh, don't don't just write this in a vacuum because uh, even the, the student, I, I've had the same experience where somebody says, you know, I haven't had this much, what am I gonna write about? And, and sometimes I see that person differently than they see themselves. And uh, I can point out things that, that they've initially struggled with and then, you know, had some success with, particularly, you know, adjunct instructors that are applying for full-time positions that if they come to me and say, hey, here's a position, you know, do you think I could do this? And how do I fit in with that? So sometimes I'll have that conversation, what, what I've seen in them in terms of, you know, this is where you started, this is what I saw of you, uh, and these are the struggles that I, you know, saw you have, uh, and this is how you work to overcome those struggles. And sometimes people are just completely insulated from that and don't necessarily see where, what their strengths are, uh, and they do want to kind of, you know, imagine what people want to hear and, and actually, uh, you know, sometimes that's worse than, than what they, they uh, probably have to say about themselves. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And, and thank you all for your great questions. I have a few very quick ones. So maybe we could get like a nod or a shake or so how useful are student evaluations in your in their um, application materials? Not so, not so useful. Okay, so we're saying that maybe not as useful. How common are teaching portfolios asked for? Not that often. Yeah. Okay. And teaching statements or diversity statements? Sometimes. Okay. All right. I just wanted to get a couple, a little bit of a litmus test there just to answer a few quick questions I'm seeing in the chat. Um, let's move on to the interview process and, and thinking about that. So, um, Curtis and Sasha, would you mind sharing uh, a couple common questions that you might ask to applicants when they come in for an interview? You'll almost always be asked something like, why do you want to teach here at this school in specific? And, and as Sasha said, the reason may be because I would like to earn a paycheck um, or because well, I live here and I want to earn a paycheck and not move. Um, we all know those are the truths, but they're not, those are not the most compelling answers. Um, it's really a good opportunity to show you've done some research on the school and understand some of their programs and how you would fit in with them. Um, most schools should ask you something about working with students from diverse backgrounds. Um, if they don't, that's not a great sign about the school. Um, and I think that's a good place to highlight anything in your own background that um, gives you commonalities with your students, um, ways in which you know your own experience and what you have struggled with um, you would carry with you into the job. Um, a lot of committees like to ask you about specific experience you ha you've had. So, you know, tell about a time when you um, dealt with a student who was being disruptive rather than how do you deal with disruptive students. Um, and the goal there in asking about an experience is to keep the answer more specific um, instead of becoming vague. Um, it's certainly fine if you pause for a moment to think of a relevant experience. I know for me, they don't jump immediately to mind. Um, and it's, I've certainly had candidates who haven't had as much teaching experience who said, well, that has never really happened to me. So let me tell you about how I think I would handle that. Um, but certainly if you have the ability to talk about a relevant experience, that's what people are looking for. Um, and again, they're looking for sort of reflective answers that show you think about how you dealt with things and that you've learned from things that may have gone wrong uh, in your teaching. Um, the last question they ask will almost always be, what questions do you have for us? For heaven's sake, have some. Um, and not about salary or benefits, because it's understandable you have questions about that, but it's too soon. Ask about the students, ask about the departments, ask about things you'd like to do and wonder if you'd have the opportunity for. Those are all great. 
Okay. Oh my gosh. There's so much happening in the chat right now that I want to respond to and I won't yet, but wow, there, I have some very strong opinions about what's going on there for later. Um, so I really want to reiterate what Curtis was saying about the specific examples. The worst thing that you can do is give vague, general, non-specific answers to these questions. And it happens all the time. It happens in high level positions. It happens when you get nervous. If you get the questions ahead of time, you shouldn't even be thinking, hey, this is how I'm going to say this. You should be writing down specific names of students or key words that you're going to use plagiarism johnny spring of 19 you know 82 whatever it is um, you really want to have these specific stories in mind so that you can use them to illustrate your experience and i also really like this idea that if you haven't had that experience you're going to have a transferable skill so you know maybe you haven't worked with students who have caused you a lot of problems but you worked in retail for a really long time so you would approach this with a student in this way here's an example of how you did that before it worked really well and you would see how that pans out in the classroom um, you should should never come in and say that you don't have struggles with students or with colleagues. You are the common denominator. What that tells us is you are the problem. So you want to make sure that you come across as understanding that you know, as an instructor, you are going to be in a position of power. And that means that you are recording grades. And sometimes students don't like the grades that you record. And so that can cause strife, or maybe they want to turn in something late, but that's not okay, because that's not with the policy, or there wasn't a, a reason for that, that you thought was valid for them to be able to do it, or it was inequitable, or whatever the situation is. You really want to be mindful of those specific experiences and how you can flip them in a good way. Um, I want to add to you also want to be mindful of, again, how you're presenting your opinion of community colleges and community college students, that is critical. I hear so much deficit minded thinking, you know, the students are really unprepared or the students are very underprepared. The students need so much help. And so, you know, it's important that they go and talk to the tutors. It's like, well, what is your role in supporting students? And also, uh, you know, that's a really exciting opportunity for you to be able to work with the students. Are you going to give us that sense that that's what you're looking forward to? Or are you going to tell us that, you know, they need help. And so you're just going to be there to hopefully teach them how to pick themselves up by the bootstraps. Also, this idea of having a question that is very specific to diversity, equity, inclusion is common, but I will add the underlying current that most of us are not going to tell you explicitly is that every question is the equity, inclusion, anti-racism question. If you are strategic in your interview, you are going to demonstrate your awareness of and dedication to and devotion to those concepts through the way that you answer literally every question, including what makes you interested in this position at this time. <laughs> So, um, and also what questions do you have for us? You can be strategic in that space too, um, like Curtis was saying. So just be really mindful of specific answers. And then also, you know, your, your truth is going to come out over the course of that interview. So just know that um, we will, we will see into your soul. So make sure that your soul <laughs> is committed to this role. <laughs> Um, so two, two things that kind of stood out there is one, this is going to be a good plug for our next one, which is going to be centered on DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So definitely come to that December 1st, same time, same, similar place. Um, but also, I, I saw in the chat a lot of surprise about student evaluations and not necessarily including that. And I, I definitely understand that, but it sounds like the specific um, evidence or the specific stories that you can think of that you can talk about in your cover letter, maybe those are some places where those might come from. And, and I, maybe we can very quickly weigh in on that. Um, Sasha, I know you were one who said that student evaluations weren't necessarily the most important one. Oh my gosh, because there's so much research that they're incredibly biased. If you are a woman, your evaluations are going to be lower. And you're also a mom or a sex symbol, which is gross. <laughs> you are not either of those things in your role as a professor, but that is how your students will talk about you. And it is revolting. So even if they have really wonderful things to say about you, this is a space where we know there's a lot of inherent bias. And it is also a non-scientific description of who and what you are. Also, we're not looking for students, very variations of their experiences with you. We're looking for your experiences with your students, typically. And so we really want to see you accessing that information. Your student evaluations are so random. They are not scientific. They do not provide the kind of data. And let's say that your evaluations are 100% excellent. Awesome. That could mean that you assign three essays for the semester. You literally write an A on every single one with no comments and you're easy. And that's why your evaluations are good. So there are so many ways that student evaluations could appear really good on the outside, but actually be a reflection of terrible teaching and 
you could have terrible evaluations from some of your students, but be a really thorough and good teacher who needs some fine tuning. So yeah, we never look at student evaluations ever. And in fact, are always talking about ways in our contracts with our unions to make them more equitable and actually reflect the work that's being done in the classroom, because in their current state, they never do. Uh, thank you. So that definitely clarifies a lot. Um, all right, so let's move on to our, our second to last question of how can we prepare for a teaching demo? Uh, Rich or Curtis, maybe you want to weigh in. So what are some topics? Will they know the topic ahead of time? What about a virtual interview? How, how would that, how might you prepare for that? I, I, I know that in terms of our full-time positions, our, our topic would always be announced. Um, but we always announce it as th that this is where we want to see a, you know, a slice of life in your classroom. So we don't want to, if we give you a topic, uh, like evolution or something like that, we don't want, you know, uh, uh, 50 hour, uh, try to squeeze 50 hours of material into 15 minutes. Uh, I've seen that, uh, type of a, a presentation done before. It, it's more uh, a demonstration of what I would expect if I was a student in your classroom to be a part of uh, in uh, just kind of a glimpse. Uh, so you certainly, if you have uh, innovative strategies that you use in terms of teaching, don't lecture to us. I, you know, certainly, you know, that, that you know, is not uh, something that comes across at all. If you spend all 15 minutes lecturing, uh, you certainly want to at least allude to that you are using some sort of interactive uh, type of material in your classroom. So even if you do lecture for 15 minutes, uh, it should be a premise that this is leading up to this activity that I hand out to the, the committee. Uh, and this is where we would go next after I've kind of laid the foundation for uh, this. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, being sure that you, you are, are not the sage on this, coming across as the sage on the stage anymore, you, you certainly want to, you know, be the guide on the side to kind of use those uh, kind of terms nowadays. Um, if you're doing a teaching demo, and there usually will be one is my experience, um, it's helpful if you can get any information from the committee or HR about the environment, because I've seen everything from you just teach the committee who sit there and watch you, or who ask you questions sort of as if there were students all the way to this is a meeting of an actual class that we're throwing you into and you'll be teaching these students about this subject um i think it's just really good to know because otherwise it can really catch you by surprise if the environment isn't what you were expecting um be sure to prep be sure to run through your teaching demo in advance um Poor teaching demos or teaching demos that, as Rich said, don't really match how you describe your teaching elsewhere um, are probably the most common reason that we drop candidates from consideration. Because, you know, ultimately, and it, it's tough because it's an artificial environment. It doesn't necessarily indicate how you are as a teacher in the day to day, but it's your chance to, to show the committee what you can do. Um, I think it can be important to do a brief statement of sort of the context before you start your teaching demo. Like, I would be covering this, um, you know, after I'm assuming I've already covered these topics in the class and this is what led up to this. Um, but another thing I'd avoid is spending a lot of time talking about what you would do as opposed to doing it. Great, right, thank you. So um, just just wanted to ask quickly, does, has anyone ever had experience where you don't get the teaching prompt or the prompt ahead of time? Sasha's nodding vigorously. Um, I have had an intern who had that experience where she got both, where she had something that she had to prepare ahead of time, but then also was given like 15 minutes to prepare on a random topic related to the class or something. So it sounds like that happens sometimes. So be prepared for all the things, but you can always ask, right? You can always ask what the format will be of the, of the interview. Thank you. All right, awesome. And so here's our last of our prepared questions. I, we're, we're running a little short on time, but I wanna make sure we get to talk about it. Um, what are some major pitfalls? So if someone goes through an interview, why might they not get hired? What are some of the big mistakes 
um, either in the interview or just the application process as a whole that we can avoid. It can be for anyone. <laughs> Super quick rundown again, uh, make sure that you complete the application as directed. So no CCV, that is a quick way to get yourself kicked out of the pool. Also make sure you have all of the required components. We are getting huge pools. Often there are hundreds of people, particularly in a full-time faculty tenured position pool for one spot. You don't want us to be able to cut you out really easily like that. We are looking to whittle down the pool. We wanna find our candidate. We wanna find our top candidates to interview. Don't make yourself one of those people we have to kick out because you didn't and attach your transcripts. Um, we want you to do well, but you want to make sure you meet to the requirements there. Um, also, in terms of getting the interview but not getting hired, no specific examples or few specific examples and not answering the whole question. We, because we have a very limited amount of time with you and we want to get as much information as possible, we'll ask you outrageous questions. Sometimes there are four or five questions in one question. And if you leave out one of those questions or a part of that that we think is important, we can't rate you as highly because you didn't even address that part or you didn't address it thoroughly. So someone was mentioning earlier and I can't remember who it was. It's okay to stop and pause and take a look back at the question and wait and say, okay, I want to make sure I've answered everything. You know, I'd like to go back to this part before I go to the next question. I feel like I need to answer that a little more clearly or more effectively, or I'd like to add an example. You can do that in the interview and you should take advantage of that. People don't and they get nervous, which is normal and a good sign. We want you to be nervous. If you're too calm, you might have issues that are concerning about your personality. <laughs> if you're too confident, we want to see that you're nervous and excited. So that's a good thing. But you know, that also comes with having to be extra prepared and mindful of how you're answering. So um, I would say that and then also come in prepared. Um, and like you're taking this seriously, you know, take notes, refer to them, have done the prep work, you know, some of the things that you're going to get asked about don't come in and go, Oh, that's a great question you know, don't do that. Come in looking like you want this job because you have prepared for it and you are here to do your best. Those are all some tips I can give you about this. There are many more, but I'll leave it there for a minute. Kind of piling on to that. I, I know that uh, I, I'm always cheering for our adjunct instructors when they apply for the full-time positions, but sometimes they, they walk in like they're a shoe in for the position. I, I've been teaching this uh, exact course for, uh, eight years and they, they come in way too uh, relaxed uh, in terms of, you know, their, their answers that it just doesn't feel like they did any preparation for it. Uh, and I always just leave the, that interview just feeling horrible for that person that they, they presumed something uh, going into the interview. So uh, don't, don't be presumptuous uh, <laughs> if you uh, are applying for a full-time position uh, at an institution where you currently are a, a part-time instructor. Um, that, that, that's one thing that, I, that, that I've seen uh, kind of implode uh, many times over the years. I think just building on something Sasha's mentioned earlier, um, a sense of a lack of respect for community colleges or the community college mission or community college students. Um, the other thing I do want to underline, because going through this process can be very demoralizing, is that sometimes the reason a candidate didn't get hired is because one other candidate was very slightly better. So again, it's not necessarily a deficit narrative about what was wrong with you as a candidate. Sometimes it comes down to, well, these candidates were both really good, but this candidate seemed particularly enthusiastic about teaching this course that we're all sick of. <laughs> you know, or that there's been a surge of interest in, so we really need someone for that. So I think it's easy to go into a downward spiral of, of questioning what you did wrong, if, especially if you have a couple interviews that don't lead to jobs, and sometimes the, the answer is, well, nothing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So there's a few different um, questions in the chat, but I'm not sure how much time we'll, we'll have a chance to get to them. And I, I apologize so much that we haven't gotten a chance to get to everybody's question. Hopefully you'll be able to answer them in the next session. Um, we'll take some of these into account. Uh, I just wonder if there's any last minute advice that, you know, in, in a minute or less that you could share with our participants um, from each of our panelists. Let's see, Curtis, do you want to start us off? 
Um, I would just urge you to consider community college teaching if it's something that you, you feel like you might be interested in doing. I found it amazingly rewarding. I am stunned by what my students have accomplished and what they've been dealing with during that. And I can really see how the, the education they were able to get has made a really tangible difference in their lives in a way that uh, I'm not sure I did when I was teaching at the four-year level. Um, so, something I hadn't mentioned but wanted to, um, look into professional organizations for your field. There's a lot of free webinars going on right now and a lot of stuff gets recorded. And if you look at what's out there, sometimes you can get a really sense of, of what the current topics are in terms of pedagogy in your field and how it may be changing and what's on people's minds. Uh, if you're in math you should or English, you should definitely know what the word co-requisite means and they can that can fill you in. So I'd encourage that. Um, so I guess we, we are out of time. Um, I just put up our contact information here if you want to follow up on anything. Um, you're, you feel welcome to reach out. I want to thank you all. I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us. So round of applause with the little reaction button from everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is so great. And I, I think we got some really great advice. Thank you all for joining us. Hopefully we're able to answer some of your questions and you're ready to go out and get prepared and, and apply for some jobs now. Um, and again, feel free to reach out anytime. Shout out to my, my students and my interns who are here. Hello, it's good to see you all. Um, and again, thank you all. I hope to see you next time and we will see you. Um, if not, have a wonderful, wonderful week. And thank you to all our veterans for tomorrow as well. It's Veterans Day. So hopefully some of you get to take the day off, but thank you to all of them as well.